Welcome to Trashy Divorces. Hey friends, I'm Alicia. My name's Stacy. Welcome back. We are running. We're running so, so far away this week. Just like our subjects. Using an English band, Flock of Seagulls today for our theme. We do talk about two runners this week. So we are bringing you a couple of our very favorite Patreon episodes from the vault. We like to do that every so often. Partly because our Sunday audience is considerably bigger than our Patreon audience, and we like to sort of share like good stuff with you, basically. So we're going to run away today, take a little bit of a holiday. We have two holiday episodes from Patreon over this past year. My story this week was recorded from St. Patrick's Day. It was the I Feel Lucky relaunch of Fun With Done. I have done two seasons now of a whole different adjunct series about Dominic Dunn and his writings. And it gets all my true crime adjacent stuff out because I have a partner who's not really into true crime. Yeah, it's not really (laughs) your thing. So back in uh, March of this year, back St. Patrick's Day of this year, I covered the story of Lord Lucky Lucan, who was not so lucky in his trashy divorce, but he does have a mysterious disappearance. It's a I feel like it's interesting really interesting story. It's like the nanny who's really not lucky in the story, right? It's all <laughs> bad. Fun with Dunn is very good. Hope y'all enjoy that one. Stacy, this week you pulled out one of your favorites. We do a lot of very feminist storytelling on Patreon, and I think on the Sunday feed too, but um I have been compiling a group of stories that I've kind of put under the banner I call Loose Women. These are women who liberated themselves in unexpected times, and they lived fascinating lives. So that's included the pirate Anne Bonny, a French opera star and sword fighter known as La Maupin, and today's story, Vita Sackville West. Vita was an English writer best known for her affair with, well, today best known for her affair with Virginia Woolf, but she lived a genuinely exceptional an occasionally outrageous life that deserves more celebrating. And so that is what we shall do today. It was a well done story. So thanks everybody for tuning in. We've got a few from the vault today. Before we get to our episode, let's pull out the magic mirror. Let's let's pull out the magic mirror and say a big thank you to our new patrons, Ariel B, Jocelyn H, Kayla G, Jeff W, Amanda K, Jacqueline G, <laughs> Jillian B. and Aaron, welcome on as a new super supporter. Thank you, new patrons, existing patrons. Thanks for supporting our independent trashy podcast dreams over here. We We, are so appreciative. We are so grateful for you. And And the very best. And for you, Sunday listeners. And Sunday listeners, we encourage you to head on over to Patreon. Stacey, there's a link. Sure. That you actually organized this week. I sort of did. Check your show notes. I actually indexed everything at the bit.ly slash trash candy quarantine. That index is on our website, helpfully, but there are links to the stories, so you can go check it out. It's kind of organized a bit. So like over there, totally for free. It's not trashy at all. It's completely off brand for (laughs) us. So totally for free on that Mm bit.ly trash candy quarantine link. There are 30 plus episodes all in these different trashy spider web rabbit hole candy piles we play down. Loose women and side pieces and Ocean's Eleven and trashy tutors and sisters and dirty digs and trashy melodies. Totally free episodes. If you run out of those, consider joining us on Patreon, patreon.com slash trashy to forces. That's us. So today you get two pretty fun examples of what we do over there, stories we really liked. We hope you like them too. How lucky do you feel? <laughs> um, you ready to pull a runner on this episode? I think perhaps we should go, go, go. So you're bringing back the fun, yeah? I'm bringing back the fun. I'm bringing back the fun. All the fun. All the fun with Dunn? This is what happens. The Fune with Dune. Oh my God. Y'all, welcome to Fun with Dunn. Welcome back. The 200 series. The next generation. That's exactly what it is. So here's the deal. You've asked. I've listened. Welcome back to Fun with Dunn. Fune. 
with Dune. Dune. The 200 series. I'm here for it. There have been threads that I've left, cases we haven't gotten into. People are excited about Fun With Done. <laughs> I'm are. excited about Fun People With Done. People are absolutely excited about Fun With Done. I think what you're trying to say is that this is going to be a monthly feature. It'll drop on a Tuesday and life is good. This will be a monthly recurring feature dropping on a Tuesday. Yes, and life is good. Boom. Look at Boom. that. Boom. Solved. Email us your questions at probablytuesdays <laughs> at gmail.com. Maybe, maybe not. Are there tacos? Okay. Today, fun with done. We're going to start with one of the most mysterious happenings <laughs> that our man Nick covered. Hmm. It's true crime adjacent. It's loaded with a trashy divorce-ish okay. too. Perfect. So far, so good. Today is a story. Do you feel lucky? Maybe. I feel lucky. It's the story of Richard John Bingham. And his wife, Veronica Duncan Bingham, otherwise known as Lord and Lady Lucan. Oh, sure. Lucky Lord Lucan. That's exactly right. Who looks just like Bradley Pitt. Oh, my God. Which Bra- so Bradford Pears in the off. movie. Yeah, he, you told me to look up a picture of him, and like he the does. In fact, is remarkable. Brad Pitt needs to slap a little mustache on, but that's pretty much the only difference. So, listeners, when you are. Hearing this story about Lord Lucan, who will also go by his nickname of Lucky. Lucky Lord Lucan. I w- Again, that- St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Mm-hmm. This is why we're doing Lucky Lucan today on the It's Your Lucky Day Fun with Donna's Back. There got a lot of threads. I got a lot going on in my brain. As you should. Quarantine brain just gets me creative. Okay. Lord Lucan is born. December 18th, 1934. He is the oldest son of the sixth Earl Lucan. And uh, he's a boy. He's the only boy in a family otherwise full of girls. So life is going to be pretty groovy for him. He will have to battle with the uh, sins of his ancestors. So (laughs) the third Earl of Lucan, his great-great-grandfather, directed the catastrophic uh, charge of the light brigade. Oh, I was going to say, is this about the Crimean War? I was In my brain, I was like, where would that put it back in history? Okay. Yeah, so the charge of the light brigade is one of the most famous disasters sure. in British military history. It resulted in the massacre of half a division in the Valley of Death at Balaklava. Oh, look at me. During the Crimean War. Mm-hmm. This... And there's a very famous poem about it. Oh, there you go. Is it by Maybe Thomas by Wolfe? Tennyson. I'm kidding. Charge of the Light Brigade. It's a very William Faulkner. Is he always the probably answer? William Faulkner, okay. noted English poet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the third Earl of Lucan, great great grandfather, has done some stuff that little, hasn't been great little, in little military flub. Correct. There. It costs a lot of lives. Yeah. So this brings disgrace to the name of Lucan. <laughs> and Lucky here is like, watch this. Well, yeah, don't worry. Like, people will forget about the third Earl soon enough because the seventh Earl uh, is going to be the first English peer in 200 years to be tried for murder. <laughs> to annihilate his family. Let's get there. He's born again, 1934. Things are going great, except for World War II happens. But his parents have a little cachet in the world. And they get their kids evacuated out to Wales in 1939. The kids then head over to Toronto after Wales becomes a little bit too hot. Eventually, the kids will go and live with a rich American lady, not lying, by the name of Marsha Brady Tucker. Until the end of the war. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. So like most families that are in the peerage, when the war ends, little Lord Lucan comes back to England and will attend Eton, where all the other little Lord sure. Lucans go. Eton? Yeah. How is that Eton? pronounced? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Eton College. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. English listeners, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's it. Eton. Okay. I haven't eaten today, have you? Okay. I had some bread. At Eaton, Lord Lucan is going to begin his love affair with gambling. 
and risk and all of his uh, addiction proclivities, let's say. Eaton will give him an opportunity to fully develop these skills as a fucked up dude. It will also give him the name of Lucky. He will complete his national service in 1953. He will serve for a year as a lieutenant. He fulfills the obligation for national service. I think you mean Lieutenant. <laughs> lieutenant. Lieutenant. Because in that Russell Crowe sailing movie trust me sailing i don't know that movie i tend to think none about russell crow zero okay lieutenant okay (laughs) lucky fulfills his one year as a lieutenant sure in the service he would be lucky lieutenant lucan wouldn't he Some guys have all the luck. In 1954, Lucky's going to get a cushy job at a merchant bank. But Lucky isn't so lucky in the workplace. He doesn't love it that much. He's not that great at banking. What he really enjoys a whole lot more is being at the Claremont Club. Sounds like more fun than work. What's the Claremont Club? Um, Yeah, okay, that too. It is a big time rich people club. Owned by a dude named John Aspinall. You can get dinner. You can also pretty much mostly gamble with other rich people, other peers, other friends with rich dudes. And eventually the Claremont Club is way more exciting than the Merchant Bank. So Lucky, when he is passed over for a promotion, has a really good night at the tables. Wins 26,000 pounds. Wow. And he's like, Fuck this regular gig thing. Yeah. I'm going to be a professional gambler. Woo! (laughs) Good life choices all around. We're going to leave him with those life choices. Sitting at the Claremont Club at the Baccarat table. And we're going to meet our bride, Victoria Duncan. Lady Lucan, before she is a lady, is Victoria Duncan. She's 26. It's 1963. Luck be a lady, Lucan. Tonight, but not. (laughs) She's an innkeeper's daughter. She works as a secretary and a model. Like, she's not anywhere close to the peerage. Did every woman in London work part-time as a model in In the 50s and 60s? Yes. Okay. Correct. I'm wondering if she knew um, the Profumo people. They're all birds. They're all birds. All right. In 1963. Little Victoria has been invited. She's 26, has been invited by her sister, Christina, who is married to another peerage dude named William Shand Kidd. This is not Princess Diana's stepfather. That is Peter Shand Kidd. But they're all Shand kids and everybody's related. Who isn't a Shand kid, really? Veronica is staying with her sister and her brother-in-law, and Veronica sees Lucky across the room. He's 29. He looks a little different than other men. Now, her sister, Christina, has already given Veronica the dish. Girl, he has socialist parents. Did you hear about the charge of the light brigade? Also, he's a professional gambler, and it's said that he's queer. Lady Lucan will say that that last bit is not true. He actually was a fine specimen of a man. But seriously, after hours of research, I don't think these two liked each other very much. But they did like to fuck. So that weekend goes well enough. He asks her to dinner next Tuesday. The love affair is on. Mm. And I say that with a questioning thing. She's 26. And she will say she was approaching the age that women get on the shelf he's 29 he's a landed british peer he needs to have a son right so so there was a lot of this would all on paper work really well for us kind of yes okay okay no and it didn't it did not no it goes very very badly burn that paper very badly but i want to add in a little bit about their courtship here Lucky is a uh, big-time boater. He loves boats. He likes competing. And there's this big speedboat race 
that he is assured in his boat, the migrant. Yeah, that he's going to win. <laughs> the migraine. Now, there's a white migrant and a migrant. And like, anyway, I've watched a lot of stuff. Okay. So Lucky is so convinced that he is going to be lucky and win. He will hire a plane and a film crew to film him doing the boat race. So no one misses his big win and race of glory. How's that go? Well, they were first and they were about to win. And lucky, as you will see, as a nickname is not always exactly true Mm. for Lord Bingham. A hole bust through the hull of the boat and the entire operation is sunk before they could cross the finish line. So he like hit a rock or something and okay, great okay Mm. boats 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 like lucky is not (laughs) boats 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 lucky is not as good of a nickname probably as he should have would have liked yeah veronica and lucky get married the wedding is sparsely attended lady lucan will say no one liked either of them (laughs) there's no one there like there was no one there to celebrate because no one cared and no one liked us lucky and ronnie getting hitched there was one notable guest Princess Alice, the mother of Prince Philip. Mountbatten. <clears throat> Who is the current consort to the queen? Correct. That guy? Okay. His mom. The Greek one? Okay. His mom. Yeah. Was there. Princess Alice. I'll follow up on her one day. She's an interesting story. Okay. Woo. Way to go, kids. They meet and they marry all in 1963. So they know each other very well. It all just goes bad. For a wedding gift... Claremont Club owner John Aspinall gives them 200 pounds to spend at the club. Lucky's going to blow through that quick and end up that night losing 8,000 pounds. Mm. 8,000 pounds. God, I would I would I would honestly be sick if I were to lose $8,000 gambling. Well, hold on. It's going to lead to a very unhappy Christmas for the newlyweds because he only had $9,000 that he got from the insurance on the sunken boat back in the race. Now they're broke, but they're only they're not for very long. Six weeks later, the sixth Lord Lucan dies. Oh. Long live the seventh Lord Lucan. Bum, bum. Now the couple has titles, money, land, a golf course. There is a substantial injection of cash, which is excellent. Because Veronica is pregnant with their first child. What do we need? A baby to save our marriage. No, we need a boy. Oh, yeah. Okay, you, you forget, need, you're you in need England, an heir, babe. We're right. in England. Once we get this taken care of, we can see whoever we want. Not a boy. It's a girl. Uh-oh. Francis. But Lucan's like, sure, now a family man. They're going to buy a home at 46 Lower Belgrave Street in London, They will buy that home for 17,500 pounds with curtains and carpets included. It's a steal. Hmm. Okay, so the idea that Lucky Lucan is ever going to be a family man is sort of laughable. Right. He's addicted to gambling. She's trying to be a mom, but they have this image to keep up. I don't know. It's probably not keeping up with the Joneses in England, keeping up with the Next door with the Chumleys. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, honestly, the the scene in yeah. London in the Ooh, early 60s. They're in, the, they're in the scene. Yeah, like this is really taking me back to the Profumo affair story That's, I did no, a couple buddies, seasons ago. Yeah. They don't have the money to be in the scene, but they're going to do it anyway. So they're in that like Mayfair jet set scene. Lucky will oil up to John Aspinall. Remember... You don't know this. Um, I'm not, I'm saying remember, but here's the thing you need to know about John Aspinall. He's made a fortune taking the money from rich landed Englishmen and putting it into his own coffers. He has enough money to begin, own, and operate not one, but two zoos. I said zoos, private zoos, just for him, where he goes out and plays with fucking tigers every day. Okay. I can't make it up. Good luck to your arms. (laughs) <laughs> One day, Lucky and John Aspinall talk, and even though it's unseemly AF, Lucan is going to take a gig at the Claremont Club. 
they start a back rack game in which Lucky will get a percentage of the bank, but it's pretty undignified for a peer to be a card dealer, but he does bring other high rollers out. The first few years with Lucky and Veronica are okay as a couple. It's not great. There's gambling. He's got some problems with alcohol. That's soon going to turn to drugs and heroin and uppers and downers, so that's fun. Yay! Veronica will have a son, George, so the pressure's off about the heir. This is about four years into their marriage, and again, they're jet set. Here's what is so interesting. The kids will go to different seasides with their nannies for vacation, but the parents will go to Monty or Monaco. Okay, so Lady Lucan... I'm not talking a lot about Dominic Dunn in this. We're going to talk about him in a minute because he does write about part of this. But he wrote, Dominic Dunn wrote in 1993. And there's a little bit more info that has been revealed since then. So this is Lady Lucan being interviewed back in 2016. The interviewer upon this part where Lady Lucan's talking about the children went to the seaside. They were just with their nanny. We were in Monte Carlo. And the interviewer almost can't get it out. And he's like, didn't, doesn't that like feel cold? Isn't that cold? And just with the chill, she says, all of my relationships are cold. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was a fascinating. Hashtag team stiff upper, upper lip. Lord and Lady, again, will head to exotic vacations. They don't have the money to do this, but they're keeping up appearances. And like, I'm not going to say he always loses at gambling, because sometimes he does win, but you should see their home movies. They're just kind of amazing, and they're in all these locales. And he loves filming her in, you know, here we are in Venice, floating through the here we are in Monty, here so we are So he was are doing in... selfies, in effect. Absolutely. Okay. But by four years in, cracks are starting to form in the relationship. She says he was not a good communicator. And even though they're going to all these exotic places and traveling and have this life of like jet set awesome, she says they never enjoy each other as a couple in any of those places. They're always on their own, which I found was kind of sad. Like it's the point of travel with you have an adventure together. I just, that was kind of heartbreaking. And when Veronica talks to him about that, she's, oh God, this is so bad. Lucky's like, yeah, that's the point of marriage. I got married to you, so I didn't have to talk to you. Yeah. They are not built for the podcast era. (laughs) So it is no wonder that four years in with a son, because remember, married women, into landed families, you got to wait until you have a son to fuck anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's about that time. And it's no wonder that Lady Lucan begins a flirtation with this dude named Grebel Howard, who by all accounts looks way better than her husband. They have dinner at the Claremont. Their phone calls. Lady Lucan says uh, they had never gone to the fatal end. What a way to describe that. We never went to the fatal end. But... Lucky Lucan will get wind that this is going on. And he goes to Howard and warns him off. And Howard's like, fuck, I'm terrified. And drops all contact with Veronica, who all of a sudden is depressed and despondent and takes to her bed. And she's really sad because of the sudden rejection. Lucky sees her in her bed. And now he's like, great. I can call you mentally unstable. As a, like, divorce ploy or something? Okay. Now we'll begin her battle with mental instability, which if she wasn't mentally unstable or vulnerable before, his behavior will make her so. Yeah. Right? Like, I've been rejected. I want to lay in bed and eat ice cream. Like, you're my husband. I can't tell. Like, But, okay, it seems all perfectly explainable. But now hubby's in charge of her medical care, and he finds male doctors. So think F. Scott Fitzgerald here. Uh, Lucky's paws are all up in her. She certainly isn't fit to have kids. (sighs) 
he's outright cruel to her. And I purposely kept some of the details out of this story because the true crime aspect is gory, but I know that you don't have the stomach for that. I've heard the story before. I know. This part is salacious and is not really needed except for one key component, which will be a big deal when we get to our crime scene investigation. After this, Lord Lucan will beat Veronica. Ten lashes with a cane. He will do this three times. I think this is a very strange and unusual way to talk to talk to your partner about maybe you'd like to explore SM tendencies. Because afterward, he is affectionate. There's a lot of mental gaming here. But what I do want you to know, he's he he's wanting to punish her. This is your punishment for, and it's it's a warped psychological, very unhealthy thing. But the thing I want you to know is with that cane that he beats her with, he wraps in sticky plasters. He wraps in band-aids. Plasters mm. are what they're called in England from mm-hmm. top to bottom. He wraps that cane in band-aids. To soften it or? Don't know. That I don't know why. I just want you to remember that little bit. Okay. Okay. They are going to have another daughter together in 1971 because certainly that will fix the falling apart marriage. Mm -hmm. And Veronica, in addition to having a husband who is trying to make her think she's crazy, she's also suffering from severe postpartum depression. And he is, uh, I'm using air quotes here, making efforts to help. Like getting her committed to the asylum. Mm, It's a good effort. And she's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So the doctors will send her home with a lot of pills and uh, sessions with a psychiatrist who goes to her home. But now Lucky is drinking and drugging and he's using uppers and downers and heroin and he's losing money hand over fist with a wife that he cannot control anymore. And he begins this plan to really undermine her with doctors. Again, F. Scott. Is she a fit mother? Now, they're not even divorced. There No papers have been filed for divorce, but they are going to be in court trying to take the kids. And her doctors are like, nah, man, like, she's fit. Sorry, she's a fine mom. Like, you don't have anything here with this. And one night in 1973, Lucky will pack up two bags and leave their home at 46 Lower Belgrave Street, never to return. Well, he will return, but gone. He doesn't he doesn't yeah, live there but, anymore. Yeah, he's out, okay. And Veronica like thinks he'll be back for a while, but he just isn't. So she's gonna go to a solicitor, a top barrister, and uh file papers on him for desertion. She needs money. She needs money to take care of the kids and the house and the bills and oh god, this is shitty. Lucky will end up kidnapping the kids. And she goes to the police and the police are like, we can't do anything. This is their parent too, which begins this whole cycle, like a year of court wrangling. And it's messy. Lucky's going to hire PIs. I'm surprised that he wanted the kids. I guess this is just really to fight with her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I don't want you to win. And it, this is so bad. He'll hire PIs. He will befriend every nanny on the block of other families in order to get dirt on her. He will provoke her on purpose on phone calls to get a rise out of her. So he's recording those at the same time and taping them. Okay. Remember drugs, all of this, like this is a horrible, this is a horrible example of behavior. He's losing money hand over fist. One of these rounds is going to cost him about 20,000 pounds to take her to court. He loses. Mm. He ends up looking really badly in this custody fight because all of these like machinations that he's doing like look way worse on him oh, yeah. than they reflect on her. Here's the fair victory of it all, though. She's granted full custody with a nanny. Okay. Okay. He will get every other weekend and half holidays, but the court does not add on any need a nanny rule. To his custody. Okay. The world is always so fair to women, isn't it? Bad stuff's about to happen, but I don't want to fool you. Like, she is not a sympathetic character. He is not a sympathetic character. 
neither is she. But you can elicit a little bit more sympathy for her because she just gets screwed over and over and over. All right. This takes us to September 1974. Lucky is $60,000 in debt. He is given 13 lots of the Lucan family silver to Sotheby's to auction. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's borrowing and begging for money. He's got uh, big problems in Pier City, right? This one. But luckily for Veronica, she's found a very nice nanny, a lady named Sandra Rivet, who perhaps a little earlier has uh, been pregnant and had a child and given that child up for adoption. Sandra's a lovely girl. And the Lucan kids, now 10, 7, and 3, really like Sandra, and she's hired. Trajectories are set. But have I mentioned never to trust a drugged-up aristocrat? Two months later, November 7th, 1974, it's a Thursday night. What I'd like you to know in England is Thursday nights are nanny's night out. Okay, didn't know that. And that does seem very germane, given what's about to happen. Lord Lucan has a plan. He's borrowed a car. He has a United States mail sack. He has a lead pipe wrapped in sticky plasters. Band-Aids. I really don't understand the purpose of all that. He will use a key and slip quietly into the home at dark. It's just his tell. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a signature. It's an MO. It's a signature thing. Like, if anybody's like, oh, I don't think Lord Lucan really did it. Nah, dude, you have the same tell on like, your it, weapon. Who takes the time to wrap your murder weapon in band-aids? A like, sadistic that's... fucker yeah. named Lord Lucan. Okay, he uses the key. He slips quietly into the home at dark. He's waiting in the downstairs where the kitchen is because it's Nanny's night out. And he knows every night before bedtime his wife goes to get a cuppa. He unscrews the light bulb. He's waiting, lying in wait. The only lights available from the hallway. He knows his wife goes to bed at nine o'clock. At nine o'clock, she's going to come down those stairs and make a cuppa. And all of his problems are about to be solved. See, you wonder why I stay up so late. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so upstairs... On Nanny's Night Out mm. is Lady Lucan. She's chilling mm -hmm. with the oldest kid, 10-year-old Francis, watching the telly. They're watching the $6 million man. And uh, remember that nice nanny, Sandra? She's so sweet. She stops by the master bedroom to see if Lady would like a cuppa, because she's going down to make herself one, because Sandra's changed her night off. And Lady Lucan's like, thanks, Sandra. That would be really nice. And off Sandra goes. It's like 9 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Sure, it's exactly the way Lord Lucan planned it, except... So a little while later, mm -hmm. Francis and Lady Lucan look at each other and like, yeah, well, I wonder where... The uh, this home is five floors, so the kitchen's on the very bottom, the mm -hmm. master is... Yeah. Like, so you n wouldn't necessarily hear anything in a room many floors above. A struggle and clunk, clunk, clunk. Okay, let me go check. Veronica sees a dark, dark hallway and calls out and then hears a sound and motion because what has happened is that Lucky and his drug and alcohol fueled plan has determined the only way to remove himself from this relationship was to kill his wife. Right. But he fucked that up. And now he hears his wife's voice. At the top of the stairs, and he is looking at a battered body of what he thinks on his wife that he has just killed, and that is not his right. wife. But it is now Nanny's Night Out. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Your humor sometimes is very dark. We don't, this is why true crime is just, there are all the reasons <laughs> we can't do true crime. Okay, we're about to get to the mystery part, though. He will go after Veronica. Not with the initial rage shown to Sandra. Veronica is beaten on the head. He tries to choke her. She will squeeze his te testicles to make him stop. And here's where Veronica gets smart. Okay, Francis, the kid, is like, what's going on down there? So they put the kid back to bed. 
And here's where Veronica's like, oh, Richard. When you say they put the kids back to bed. Yeah, they put the kids back to bed. She's got a bloody head, but everything's fine. It's stories alter in this a little bit, but I'm going to give you the what I can't account for. She starts playing it. Honey, I'm on your side. Let's get rid of the body. I can stay inside for a few days. No one will see this. It's fine. Please don't kill me. I'll help you. We can get you out of this. Because the problem that he did have is no longer his new problem. Okay? She's buying time. The body of Sandra Rivet will get into that sack. And Veronica never says she helped him with that. But there is cross-contamination. Her blood is found in Mm -hmm. that. So I think she will help. She just won't admit it. But she's trying at this point to stay alive. So he asks if uh, she has sleeping pills. And she's like, yeah. So they head off to get the sleeping pills. He will bring her the pills. And when he is off in the bathroom to get water, she thinks that, of course, he's trying to drug me so he can just smother me. He doesn't want to do the rage thing down there, but he's going to get me to sleep and then kill me anyway. She will wait, Veronica, for him to go to the bathroom and turn the water on. And she splits in the fastest ready to fucking run ever. And she heads down all those flights of stairs out the door, turns left and makes it to the end of the block where the plumber's arms pub is. So she busts through the door, pajamas and blood soaked and a bunch of drunk pub goers are like, what the fuck? But she's going to get enough attention to have the police called, get tended to, and then get hospitalized for head injuries. She will survive this. The bigger mystery is what the fuck happens to Lucky. Because he doesn't anticipate her taking off. And now he's really fucked, right? So he is going to take off in the stolen car. Not stolen, borrowed car. He's going to go by a friend's house. And it's late. And that friend, her husband isn't home. And she's not going to answer the door to a frantic knock in the middle of the night. Yeah. There's a phone call to her after, but it's just noise. Like, she doesn't understand what the... Okay. By 1130, Lucky shows up at this uh, home called Grant's Hill Farm. Grant's Hill Farm. It's the home of Ian and Susan Maxwell Scott. And he comes in. And he, right, has had almost two hours to work on his story. And Lord Lucan's like, I've been in a struggle and uh, they're going to think I'm the one I'm the one who's done this, but I fended off a murderer. And so he's going in and vending this cover story to his friends. He's totally lying. He's going to write two letters at the Maxwell Scotts. Both of them are to his brother-in-law, William Shand Kidd. Both of these letters are in reference to the kids. One of them is like, tell them good things about me. You know, tell him the truth. Tell him I didn't do this, blah, blah, blah. The other letter is about legal matters. What my bills are, who can pay, who can wait. There will be a third letter written to one of his best friends, like tell my kids the truth. He writes three letters that go, if you look at them from denial to reckoning to acceptance to he's made some sort of plan, But nobody knows what the plan is. So by the time the morning papers hit, the headlines are scandalous. Nanny murdered. Missing Earl. He's gone. He's gone like the wind. The borrowed car is found in this port town called New Haven, which is near the river that will get you into the English Channel. In the boot of the car is a bottle of vodka and another lead pipe wrapped in fucking sticky plasters. New Haven is also where Lord Lucan has his boat docked. There's also a ferry that leaves from Newport. So there's a lot of different escape ports if you're trying to get out of town. But here begins the mystery. You want to take a breath? I need to take a breath. (sighs) Well, the mystery is he's gone, right? And he's never seen again. Gone. He's never seen again. Mm. So it's no mystery that he killed poor Sandra. There is a coroner jury trial, which because of this case, he is tried in absentia for murder and found guilty. The think like this is the last time it happens in England. It's outlawed in 1976. 
we can't believe you did that to appear and tried him without. So you can't do that anymore in England because of fucking Lord Lucan. He is found guilty. The manhunt is spectacular. They are searching country houses high and low. Where's your priest hole, ma'am? You know, there are sightings all over. It becomes an international manhunt. Like, where's Lord Lucan? And no one ever finds mustachioed Brad Pitt. Uh Uh-uh. No, it clearly went to America and had an affair with Brad Pitt's grandmother. We can solved. Okay. So a few ideas about what could have happened. Death by suicide. It's easy enough to slip into a boat, weigh himself down. He already had the weights because this is what he was going to do with Veronica's body. Puncture the whole drown at sea. He knows how to sink a boat. He could have just done to himself what the plan right, was going to be to her and just get rid of the evidence. This is where, and you're like, finally, Alicia, talk about Dominic Dunn. Dominic Dunn has an article called The Gentleman Vanishes in the Vanity Fair issue from May 1993. I've used him, I've used Dominic Dunn for details in this, but I've specifically kept this sort of out of the writing, because I would like you to go and read that. Fun with Dunn's going to take a little bit different of a turn where we're going to deep dive into like updates on cases that he, Dominic, may have investigated. I'd like you to read that article and just his breathless way of telling about this manhunt. Okay. Lucky knows how to sink a boat. Maybe he's long dead. Maybe he jumped the ferry and jumped off the ferry to land in the propellers. Like maybe he was dead that night. I mean, he wrote... Like, OJ letters, tell my kids that, like, very similar to that vein. The morning before the murder happens, I want you to know that uh, Lucky met with his uh, top best, uh, his solicitor, and uh, threw out the law business that they were doing. Lucky attained the information that without a body, they cannot declare you dead for seven years. So there would be no probate that would go to his widow for seven years if his body isn't found. Mm -hmm. And it fucks her for seven years and would allow his children to come of age without ever letting her be in the mix of that. It's kind of petty. You can see how that might be of interest to the case. There's also a lot of speculation that his rich and powerful friends helped scurry him out of the country. Maybe he made an escape. He would have needed his friends to do this because at his apartment, they find passport, clothes, his glasses, money, everything that you nor like your glasses. You take your glasses with you if you're going to make an escape. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, maybe he escaped that night out of New Haven. Maybe he escaped at a later date and New Haven was just a ploy to distract, distract. Maybe he even was murdered by money lenders that he was in debt to, and they found a really nice way to tie up their loose ends, getting him out of the way. There's also a rumor. Maybe he was fed to the tigers at John Aspinall's zoo. <laughs> this is what John Aspinall's mother said. John Aspinall's mom and Lucky Lucan are extremely close. They're like, she's substitute mom for him. So she kind of in jest says, oh, I heard he got fed to the tigers at the zoo. Dominic Dunn is convinced that Lord Lucan is alive and out of the country. Dominic Dunn knows Aspinall and all the other fat cats that Lucky hangs with, including Klaus von Bülow is friends with Lucky Lucan. And there's always something there that Dominic Dunn is sniffing around to discover. And he's like, you guys are so touchy when I bring this subject up. That you all squirm, and I don't think you'd be quite this squirmy touchy if there wasn't a there there. But in the Mayfair jet set, Lucky is lauded. This is where the narrative turns because Veronica is unpopular, and nobody likes her, and she's not our kind anyway. And like everybody kind of takes, there's some delicious writing in this article. I encourage you to read it, May 1993. In 1999, Lucky is declared dead, but no death certificate is issued. That will not happen until 2016. So I want to give you an update on Veronica. 
she has custody of the kids until 1981, where her trauma, mental instability, addictions will cause the courts to actually take her kids away from her and be put into being fostered by her sister, Christina, and her brother-in-law, William Shan Kidd. She will not speak to those kids for 35 years. No contact with her kids once she gives up custody. I these uh, both sound like really both of these adults sound like really strange horror. people. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine how this fucks up your kids? It fucks her up too. Sounds like she already was the sending them to separate vacations with like I mean, I get that you can do that sometimes, but if that's just like how it works. Oh, it's summertime, kids. Go have fun at the shore with the nanny and we'll see you in the fall. I mean, the kids by all accounts have a much better life growing up with their aunt and uncle. Like they're all very well adjusted. They're all very successful. Yeah. No, it sounds like their parents were both nightmare people. In the... Last few years, Veronica made it to her 80s. She was living in the Muse house behind the house on Belgrave. She will, in 2017, self-diagnose herself uh, because her hand shakes one day and she thinks she has Parkinson's. So she begins to plan her death by suicide, which will happen a few months later via alcohol and barbiturate poisoning. But the story's not over. When she dies, she will cut all three children out of her will. She will say their lack of good manners and reverence shown to me has caused me to make this decision. She will donate her 600,000 pounds ish to a charity supporting the homeless called Shelter, which I'm sure that organization appreciated. And her kids like always very proper in their statements, which is kind of remarkable. There's never a bad word issued or said about either one of their parents. I can't even imagine how much therapy those kids have had. Yeah. Okay, but the story's not over. There's a dude, Neil Berryman, who says that he, big reveal, is the secret son that was adopted, whose mom is Sandra Rivet, the nanny who was murdered. And he wants her murderer found and held accountable. So this dude over the last few years, has spent about 30,000 pounds of his own money to hire private investigators. It, I think, looks a lot like the uh, uh, Dursley's mailbox, um, that he just gets all these anonymous letters in the post with all of these hints and allegations. Uh, but every time he does, he gets them investigated well, and, and all takes of, them to the authorities. All of, I mean, this, I mean, let's use the term peer group, but like this whole setup, they would have had, you know, homes in the Riviera. They would have, you know, like compounds in the wherever, and they could easily hide a person for an extended period of time so this in is, quite yeah. a bit of luxury. So this is Dominic Dunn's gushy, gushy article, Mm -hmm. The Gentleman Vanishes, because he talks about the 100-acre island that someone has that can hold 50 comfortably, 100 in a push. Like, there are places that Lucan could have gone and never been. It's going to go mess with, yeah. Never been seen again. So he could be living off the largesse of his friends. Sandra Rivett's kid is still determined to bring him to justice. Although Lord Lucan would be 86 by now and probably is more than likely dead if he wasn't already in 1974 when the whole nefarious thing happened. I feel lucky, Mm -hmm. Lucan. That is the nefarious, true crime, almost trashy divorce, fun with done, dirty digs adjacent Story of the seventh Earl of Lucan. Lucky in his trashy, trashy life. The seventh, but not the worst. I don't know. The other guy really, he killed like tens of thousands of people. Okay, so we're just going on the scale of killed less people. Okay. Then third Earl, you win. Okay, fine. Seventh is the worst, but there is actually a competition for it. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, everybody forgot about number three. Well, what's when number that? seven came along. Anyway, that is fun with done. The Coming next back. Generation. The next generation, series 200. Next one will be back in April. Oh, and it's good. I'm so excited. Thanks, y'all, yeah. for listening and supporting us. Wash your hands, wash your face, social distance. We're going to get through this. Yeah, we're all going to get through it together. And uh, hell, we're going to, I'm going to send this out to everybody so everybody has something to do today. Fun with Dunn is back. Hashtag, Tuesdays. Hashtag in this together. Tuesday just got a lot more fun. With Dunn. Ha. Cheers, friends. Keep it trashy. Bye. Bye. Your son is snacking. Now, be sure we get all the delicious cat crunching in the background. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Alicia. Welcome to Trash Candy Connoisseur. It's Cinco de Mayo. That's all Cinco we. De Mayo. All we need to focus on. It is Cinco de Mayo. And Taco Tuesday. Are hard shells or soft shells better? We inexplicably slept until noon today. I'm not even sure. We didn't really sleep. You slept. I didn't sleep. Well, I, and I didn't sleep. I. The cats got me up at four and I was up till about eight. So yeah. Anyway, it's been a weird day. Hi listeners. You probably don't care about any of this and how time is meaningless, but maybe you feel like time is meaningless in your world too. We're all just in the same day, man. It's all the same fucking day. Largely true. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, so we're here today. Yeah. For a little trashy literature. Sure. Uh, or really, this is really inspired by your recent forays into, um, into April in Paris and the and the lives of interesting women who did it their way. Are we spending May in London? I don't know if we're spending May in London. We're <laughs> spending Cinco de Mayo in London. Let's do it. Cheerio. So I have a story I've called Loose Women, the Vita Sackville West story. Fantastic. Um, so Alicia, you have been highlighting these amazing stories of women who who built incredible, unique, and even liberated lives in Paris in the 19th and 20th centuries. I've got one for you from across the channel. Perfect. So a lot of people know the name Vita Sackville West because of her decade-long relationship with Virginia Woolf, but in their own time, it was actually Vita who was um, the more well-known writer and much better selling really? of the pair. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Virginia Woolf's writing is is challenging. It's, you know, I think Vita was writing more kind of mainstream stuff. And anyway... So we're going to talk about her. Do it. I, yeah. I, this is great. I feel like this story gets told a lot from the perspective of Virginia Woolf or from oh, buddy. from um, from the exploration of Virginia Woolf's life. And so I'm trying to just like, we're going to talk about Vita Sackville West. And Virginia Woolf is a player in her life. But that's, that's okay. I, I can't wait to hear it. Okay. Vita is from a fancy old English family. Her father was the third Baron Sackville. Oh. And uh, her lineage is full of surprises. Vita's mother, Victoria, was the illegitimate daughter of the second Baron Sackville and a Spanish dancer named Josefa de Olivia Pepita. Holy cat. As her friends knew her. And Pepita's mother, in turn, had been an acrobat. Oh, my God. Who married a barber. Fantastic. And keep in mind back then, Barbers, he may well have been doing surgery as well as trimming beards and cutting hair. Like, this is like... There were no medical degrees. It didn't matter. So, Victoria, Vita's mom, was the daughter of... Come for the haircut. (laughs) Stay for the incision. Stay for the appendectomy. (laughs) Uh, So... So, Victoria is Vita's mom. She's the daughter of Lionel Sackville West, second Baron Sackville. And Victoria married Lionel Sackville West, the third Baron Sackville, her cousin. No. It's so gross. Um, and The then, heart wants what the and, land deed says. And then Victoria gave birth to Vita, whose given name is Victoria. What? Oh, God. There are just okay. far Perfect. too many Lionels. And, and Lionel Wolf is... Um, oh, is that right? Is it Lionel or Leonard? I think it's Leonard. Anyway, boom, boom. lots of Lionels, lots of Victorias in the story. So she she became known as Vita to distinguish her from her mother, Victoria. Okay. That makes sense. 
Vita was born March 9, 1892. Mm. She's a Pisces. Mm-hmm. And she grew up in an English country estate in West Kent called Knoll. Nice. That had been in the family since Queen Elizabeth I gifted it to Thomas Sackville centuries no before. way. Way. So very old money, very established peerage, all of that. You said Elizabeth I, like... Oh yeah, five hundred. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth the five hundred years of yeah, uh, three three hundred years before yeah, give or take. She was fifteen. Yeah, that's and landed. Change. Okay. Oh Perfect. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. No, they'd landed long before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so her parents had sort of a distant marriage. They were apparently quite happy when they first married, but then dad took a mistress and then moved to the mistress in at Knoll with the rest of the family. And no. And then Victoria was like, well, if this is how it's going to be, Lionel, then I too shall have lovers. And so J.P. Morgan was one of her oh lovers. Oh, my God. And I think that her true love, she, sp- she had like a 15-year-long, um, I mean, a- affair, I guess, but like 15-year-long relationship with someone named Sir John Murray Scott. And like he had... Like, Vita spent time at his house in Paris quite a bit, or his apartment, or whatever. I mean, this was just... I always see in these stories, like, while open marriages were unusual for the day, but all of the marriages were open. Apparently, yeah. Well, whether you knew about it or not, everybody's fucking around with everybody else. I think... I, I think the Sackville West family knew what was up. Yeah. Okay. Vita was quite isolated from other children when she was young. So initially she was homeschooled by governesses and, you know, as like a five-year-old or whatever, she wasn't really running in an age-appropriate peer group because there were just adults around. I think she was also an only child. I know her cousin ended up inheriting, her male, sorry, cousin ended up inheriting Noel. Understandably, the exquisitely complex dynamics of her home life combined with distance from people her own age turned her toward writing, and she never left it. Curious that. Hmm. She would attend Helen Wolfe's very exclusive school for rich girls in Mayfair, where she met two of her early loves, Rosamund Grosvenor and Violet Keppel. Rosamund, born September 5th, 1888, of Virgo, uh, four years older than Vita, and uh, (laughs) Rosamund was 10 when they first met. So, okay, the second... Boer War in South Africa broke out okay. when I think when Vita was about seven and her dad, you know, I mean, he's a peer of the realm, went off to fight. I Boer is Dutch for farmer, which gave me some insight into what this is all about. But like, I don't I could not tell you the geopolitics of the Boer Wars. <laughs> Get on that. Anyway, Pops leaves. Vita is crushed, devastated, sad, terrified. Her mother, Victoria, invites Rosamond to come stay at Knoll to keep oh, Vita that's company. Nice. And this kicks off a lifelong family friendship with them. Oh. And when they become teenagers, it will turn romantic. Um, I, yeah, the, I don't think 10-year-old Rosamond was up to anything bad with six-year-old Vita, but hopefully not. In 1911, I think Vita was about 18 at this point. She, Rosamond, and a governess took a holiday to Florence. And by this point, Vita and Roddy, as was her nickname, uh, were very, very much in love. And the next year, Roddy joined the Sackville Wests at their home in Monte Carlo. In Monte. Stayed for three weeks. Wow. Apparently, by the end of this, um, Lady Sackville, like Vita's mom, was just like, I hate Rosamond. <laughs> She's so over her. Oh, no. is she over Rosamond or is she over the fact that maybe her daughter's sleeping with Roddy? <sighs> So it's a fair question mm-hmm. because it it Vita will Vita has no shame about any of this. Yeah, Rosamond sounds life. delightful. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, certain things were expected of young ladies of proper bearing, regardless of how they felt about life. And so around this time, Vita was being courted by several male suitors. There was Lord Granby, wildly rich and the inheritor of a very old family title. He earned like a hundred thousand pounds a year. He had a ton of land, and Vita's parents were like, "Yeah, welcome, son-in-law." Fantastic. Then there was this other person. Oh no, Harold Nicholson, born November twenty-first, eighteen eighty-six, a Scorpio. Harold was a young diplomat. 
His annual salary was about 250 pounds. And his family had entered the upper crust only recently when his father had been made a peer oh. by Queen Victoria. Huh. Vita found a discreet, independent-minded young man who placed no particular constraints on her in exchange for the same considerations. Because it turns out both of them were bisexual, and Harold very likely was a gay man. Like, I, I think in a different time, he would have, like, it, in modern times, I, I think he would have married a man. Like, I, I think he would have happily lived life but as what a gay man. That, so it sounds like they made a convenient arrangement. They did. Hey, let me ask you a quick question. Uh-huh. You said Violet Keppel? Violet Keppel, yes. Are you going to talk more about her? Mm-hmm. Is she related to Alice Keppel? Yes, that's her. The, Alice is her mother. No way! Yes, and Violet will go on to have a long relationship with the the daughter of the singer sewing machine for like the heiress of yeah who's who yeah she's part of your um romaine brooks crowd like she had a relation like yeah they all tie together winoretta winoretta there you go apparently virginia wolf like claimed to have had a fling with winoretta as well dude lots of sisters are doing it for themselves yeah sorry i just heard keppel and was like uh-huh. i wonder if that Mm-hmm. Sorry, please continue. Yeah, Alice Keppel is her mother. Fantastic. And uh, who's the mistress of Fast Eddie? The really seven? Yeah. Oh, fascinating. We talked about Alice Keppel. I Alice thought the Keppel name sounded familiar. Is Camilla her great, grandma? Great, okay, yeah. so Charles goes and finds her jewelry all the time and correct. Purchases, that's, that's Alice, Alice Keppel. Keppel. Amazing. Okay, it, trash candy, spider webs. Ooh. It all comes back around. All right. Well, I'm glad we're doing this. Okay. So they courted for 18 months. Vita says that during this time, there was never so much as a kiss oh. shared between them. Well, that's convenient. Mm-hmm. She married him in 1913 at the age of 21. Wow. Her parents were opposed. Naturally. Uh, yeah, which is uh, more than a little ironic since I think a lot of the attraction between the two was the permissibility of an open marriage. Like, oh, I don't know. Vita's parents had had. <laughs> right. <laughs> Free love. Okay. Do as I say. So both Vita and Harold enjoyed same-sex relationships throughout their many, many decades together. And they genuinely, I mean, a different kind of marriage, certainly. But, like, I think they had a really good marriage. It's, I mean, life is funny. Okay. So this triggers Rosamond Roddy to break up with Vita. She's just like... I'm out. I can't believe you're marrying this guy. I'm done. Oh, poor Roddy. Yeah, she 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 does well. It's fine. <laughs> all these people have a lot of money and English country homes and all like. It's poor, not the worst. Poor Roddy. Yeah. Poor Roddy. No, the Grosvenor name. Her her family was William the Conqueror's gamesman hunt master hunter or Holy something cats. yeah th- these people are don't don't waste your time feeling too bad for these people it's they're okay poor roddy has a broken heart and i sure can feel bad about that yeah all right harold's diplomatic work took him abroad often and so after he and vita married their first home together was in a suburb of constantinople not Istanbul. Fantastic. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, she became pregnant with their first son, Benedict, in 1914. And so they came back to England to make sure that she would give birth with English doctors. Okay. Uh, and then World War One broke out. So they were kind of homebound for a few years. Um, they had another son in 1915 who was stillborn. And in 1917, their son, Nigel, was born. So that is that is their, their childbearing. Um, so, so two boys. Two boys, yeah. Okay. And so I, I need to be really careful about making it seem like there are clear delineations in the timeline of Vita's many loves, because there are not. <laughs> there are not clear delineations there. So Violet Keppel, born 6 June 1894, a Gemini, um, is another schoolmate from Helen Wolfe's. She also had become a lover of Vita's during their teenage years. Ooh la la. Rosamond was her primary. Yeah, right? tricky poor roddy and then uh like her family bugged out the king died and they went into like 
their family went into like a two-year period of mourning or something and like kind of disappeared from the social yeah, circuit. Yeah, because her mom was fucking the, like, it, yeah. Wow, that makes so much sense now. Yeah. Because her mother was the long time. Edward the Seventh? I think Eddie the Seven, yeah. Permanent mistress of the king for oh my like God. 30 years or something I was, crazy. Because that's so funny. Because when I read that, that like Edward the Seven died and so her family just like, it left all comes to back the country around. to to yeah to mourn to formally mourn for like oh. a long time like two or three years all comes anyway. back around on the guitar trash so, candy okay so so trashy mom allows violet to uh i'm kidding um anyway violet you know returns to social life at the end of this period of mourning reaffirms her love for vita okay and because Vita is now engaged, she becomes engaged. Oh, the classic. Um, retaliatorily. Perfect. I will make classic you jealous. Classic move. Classic move. So Vita, of course, marries anyway. But in April of 1918, she and Violet head off to Cornwall for a while. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, Your Cornwall's lovely we'll this time of year we'll, for a holiday. We'll trip with my pal. Um. So World War One ended. We like to bird watch together. Yeah. So <laughs> World War One ended on the 11th of November um, in 1918. Okay. Within days, these two were in France together. <laughs> oh my! For months. Fantastic. I love this story. <laughs> and so at this point, Violet is engaged to her future husband Dennis Trefusis, and because of the intensity of her relationship with Vita, she made Dennis promise that they would never have sex, or she would not marry him. Uh- and Dennis. Agrees. Marries her anyway. What kind of... Whoa. Okay. I do not have any information on Dennis, Dennis. being like also like privately gay and like that's cool because he wasn't planning to Maybe anyway. Maybe he's ace and he's like, that works just fine for C- me. Yeah, I don't... I nah. That does not appear to be what the story is. <laughs> so. A few months later, late in 1919, Violet and Vita head back to France for a couple more months Violet's mother at this point sits Dennis down and was like, listen, I don't know when this all started, but those two are fucking and they're (gasps) going to France because they can fuck there and no one cares. And you need to go get your wife and tell her to stop fucking Vita Sackville West. Oh, my God. So he does. No. And then in February 1920, off they go again. This time, both of the husbands team up because at this point, Vita is over in France like... Dressing as a man, going by the name Julian, like, like living as Hanging a man. out with Natalie Barney? Almost certainly. I yeah. mean, I, I, it didn't come up in my research, but it's hard to imagine that they were not in the same circle. Well, I mean, that's what their circle, like, yeah. No, that's the circle. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, and, and, I mean, Harold works for, like, the foreign office or what, you know, like, he's a diplomat for the British government, and stories are circulating, like, rumors are getting... And his wife is a cross-dresser named Julian? With a lesbian lover, yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. So, um, the husbands team up. Oh, God! They hop into a two-seat aeroplane, fly across the channel... And there were loud words publicly exchanged in France on the way to the men retrieving their wives. Oh, my God. We thought Victoria and Tenny would make a hella movie. This would make a hella movie. Yeah. So they snuck off together a few more times through, like, 1922. It doesn't sound like they're sneaky. <laughs> but Harold became more firmly against the romance. It's, again, it was... Like you're embarrassing me. Reputations sure. are so important at this level of English society. So, at some point, he threatened to divorce Vita if she didn't knock this off. Dennis is like, you know what? I know how to f- how to fix this. We're moving to Italy. No, and so off they go. And I think Dennis died like a within a decade or so. And so anyway, when um when Violet returned to England for World War Two. Um, they reconnected as friends. I don't know that they rekindled their romantic wink, relationship, wink. but yeah, yeah. Um, and, but they were they were friends for the duration. Um, and for her part, Violet would go on to strike up a long relationship with Winnerette Singer, an ex of Romaine Brooks. Yeah, they were totally in that set. Yeah, I knew what they were do. I knew what they were doing on Fridays and in who 1920 was- in Paris. 
Romaine lived in Italy mm -hmm. for a while, too, and mm -hmm. others went down because they were kind of drawn to Mussolini and fascism. Is that right? Correct. Uh, uh, who Romaine and Natalie went to England. They were kept inside the gates by like Mussolini and they went down with Ezra Pound. Oh, right, right. They sunbathed in uh, Mussolini's garden. It's awesome. In Italy. Fascism okay. is cool. Is that Italy, Mussolini? Yeah. Okay. You said England. Sorry. Um, which there's there's a whole lot of fascism going on in the there's, 19th century, the 18th century. A... So I get a little. No, Harold was at one point friends with um, the guy who would go on to form the British Union of Fascists or oh, something. No. Yeah. He, to be clear, Harold was not a, a British fascist, fascist. himself. <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay. So Vita was writing throughout all of this period. So there was a lot of poetry. She was also churning about churning out about a novel a year through like 1926. And many of these were bestsellers. In 1923, she published a book called Challenge in the United States. Uh, it was banned in the United Kingdom <gasps> until 1974. What? And the book is the story of Julian. Oh my. Uh, and his stormy relationship with Eve. Violet. Who is a poorly disguised Violet. Yeah. Aww. And in, um, there's a, a movie called Vita in Virginia that I watched on Amazon Prime as part of this. And uh, Isabella Rossellini plays her mother, Victoria. Interesting. And one of the first scenes, actually, I think the first scene, including Victoria, she's got a copy of this in her hand. And she's like, if you publish this here, I'm cutting you off. This is not even, this is not fiction. This is about your affair with that woman and like throws it down. Oh, and, and, no. and the two little boys are there eating, eating sweets and just watching this like dramatic confrontation between mom and daughter. Oh, my. <laughs> anyway, so it was not. Again, Vita Sackville West just did not care to Have you hide. met a Pisces? I don't. Good, br come on. Pisces yeah. don't have time for your bullshit. All right. So Rosamond is gone. Violet is gone. And in 1922, Vita meets fellow writer Virginia Woolf. Yeah. And is, I think, entranced by her just from go. And they developed a very warm relationship that sort of... Virginia Woolf very famously, like, the, the things said about her are, like, she was frigid or whatever. Like, I I hope that we have sort of moved into a phase where those sorts of descriptors are not, um, like, Virginia Woolf was a trauma survivor. And, yeah. you know. Okay. So it did gradually become romantic between them over the course of a few years. Scholars put them together as a couple from about 1925 to 1935. Wow. But Vita's friendship with Virginia and her husband Leonard was also creatively rife and professionally beneficial to all of the above. Virginia Woolf. Born Virginia Stephen on January 25th, 1882, an Aquarius. Mm -hmm. She was 10 years Vita's senior and hailed from uh, like a wealthy London household, but not aristocratic, like upper middle class, okay. I think is... Um, so there actually was a class difference between the two because, like, Vita is nobility and Virginia was not. So her childhood included significant trauma with apparent sexual abuse at the hands of an older brother. The household actually included eight children, including three from her mother's first marriage uh, from which she had been left a widow. So so she had three siblings who were significantly older. Okay. Um, and so one of those brothers, uh, it turns out, was not a good guy. That, yeah, that's bad. Yeah. Then, uh, dude, Virginia's mom dies of influenza when she's 13. Mm. And then her older sister, again, part of that cohort of, of oldest kids. Um, so this older older sister had stepped in to fill the maternal role and look after the younger kids. Okay. She dies in 1897, like two years later. Ah. Uh. Yeah, like Virginia's life got... Tragic. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, Virginia herself quite famously lived with mental health challenges throughout her life that first appeared during this period of just intense loss and familial dislocation. Her dad will die, I think, in 1904. Just a... Sad. Just a rough run. Yeah. All right. So that said, it was a bookish and creative family. And aside from the formal and informal education that all were treated to, their father had a humongous library and all of the children were encouraged to read. 
the kids have their own little newspaper for a while. Nice. Yeah. The Atlanta Atlas. <laughs> we do on our street. We have the Atlanta <laughs> Atlas. Our neighborhood kids make a paper and it's like 20 bucks for like a year or something. A half a year subscription, Whatever. I think. Whenever they feel like asking for money. <laughs> I love it. It's my very favorite thing that happens, the Atlanta Atlas. It's all handwritten. Anyway, um, all right. So, yeah, they would document the goings-on at at their home. And uh, Virginia would eventually study at the ladies' department at King's College of London because education was completely segregated by gender. So, yeah, dad dies in 04, and then Virginia and some of her sort of contemporary siblings, like not the older set, um, move to the Bloomsbury District in London's West End, where it was cheaper, bohemian, and basically perfect for a bunch of creative kids suddenly on their own in their early 20s. Great. Mm -hmm. See a Broadway musical coming on. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And her sister, Vanessa, was a a noted painter of the time, and uh, like it was... It was the dream. I mean, the Bloomsbury group was the dream. Right. Um, so their home became a hub for writers, thinkers, artists. Uh, eventually, it came to be known as the Bloomsbury group. And it was in this in the circle that Virginia got to know Leonard Wolfe, a fellow writer who would formally propose to her in 1912. She was not quick to say yes, but eventually she did acknowledge that maybe marrying him would not be the worst thing. <laughs> And so they married on August 10, 1912. Okay. And I don't want to understate the gravity of the mental health struggles that Virginia was living through. Like, she attempted suicide many times in her life, including shortly after she got married, which must have been, like, her marriage to Leonard Wolf was very interesting, but he did a lot of work to... I don't know, to support his his wife, who was frequently mm. in bouts of, like, cataclysmic depression wow. or similar. I, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the thinking is on what her diagnosis would be if she were alive today. Yeah. Anyway, so, yes, a few months after they get married, she attempts suicide. And after her first book is published in 1915... She attempts suicide. Like it's she I think she just gets so exhausted by events. And it I don't know, it happened to obviously she will eventually die by suicide in 1941. It's Um, terribly tragic. It is. Yeah. At the same time, Virginia Woolf pioneered a new style of writing and is considered one of the masters of modernist literature, 20th century literature, which contrasts her with Vita, whose admiration for the classical style of writing is likely why her lover, less appreciated in their own time, has so eclipsed her in the public mind. Hmm. 1917, the Wolfs found Hogarth Press to publish Bloomsbury Group writers, including Virginia. And as her friendship with Vita intensified, Vita signed on to publish with Hogarth, which was eventually a big financial help to the imprint. So Vita releases a book called Seducers in Ecuador. (laughs) Which came out around the same time that Mrs. Dalloway was released and soon overtook it on the bestseller list. There was sort of a creative rivalry between the women. Okay. Um, But it was one that, like, creates creatively Virginia always won because she was, like, opening up new approaches in literature. Like, she was expanding what it meant to be a writer. Okay. And to write fiction. Um, but commercially Vita was always outpacing her. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. So Vita and Virginia had one of the more creatively fertile partnerships that I can think of. I wonder how they felt about oatmeal raisin cookies. (laughs) I think they understood that chocolate chip is the superior. (laughs) Stay tuned for trashy tidbits, friends. Mm -hmm. Vita's boldness and her clarity... Of self-image, she understood herself to have two distinct halves, one feminine and attracted to men, and one masculine and attracted to women, inspired Virginia, and Vita was diligent in her praise and encouragement of Virginia and her work. This apparently resulted in a fairly fulsome reappraisal of, like, Virginia's own life by herself, like, Virginia reconsidering sort of her own view of herself. And uh, it also helped her to find better coping strategies to support her mental health. Because in this era, I am ashamed to report 
that in this era when women had brain troubles, uh. what the doctors and her father uh, always advised was like, well, you need to stop using your brain then. If your brain's driving you, you need to stop reading. You need to stop writing. It'll hurt you. You need to go you out too much. back and dig a hole, wear yourself out. That's how you, then you come in and you go to bed and you stay in bed. You do not. Don't think. Yeah. Don't think. Dude. And of course the things that Virginia loved were reading thinking. and writing and thinking. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she had been, it had been drilled into her that all of these things that she enjoyed and were meaningful to her and, and gave her purpose were damaging to her. And along comes Vito, like, no, dude, you don't need to go dig a hole out back. Like, read a book. Like, you're cool. Do stuff you're interested in doing. Yeah. Ginny. All right. So, yeah, Vito was like, yo, that's totally dumb. You love reading. You're a once in a generation writer and you hate doing all this working out stuff. So, go what, what are we doing? In the here? Back? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Waste of time. So, indeed, Virginia's day-to-day struggles, they they did seem to diminish. Um, and so while Seducers in Ecuador was not, like, the biggest hit that Vita ever released, her next book, The Edwardians, was a huge, it sold, like, 100,000 copies in six months. Wow. Um, made Hogarth a ton of money. Virginia, meanwhile, spent several years of their time together composing Orlando. Yeah. A book that Vita's son has called the longest and most charming love letter in literature. Aww. The story follows a gender-switching protagonist across centuries of time during which he and or she never ages, having adventures, falling in love, traveling with the Romani people, which Vita identified strongly with that um, because of her, I guess, her Spanish heritage. Okay. I don't the know. The acrobat heritage. The acrobat heritage, uh-huh. yeah. And the book, uh, the story ends at midnight on the day of the book's publication, which is super meta. I have not read Orlando, but I've seen the Tilda Swinton film Uh version of it a few times. And all right. So according to a write up, just a little essay on the the Vita Virginia romance by um, Maria Popova on brainpickings.org, quote, on October 11, 1928, the day Orlando published, Vita received a lavish package containing a pristine copy of the book and Virginia's original manuscript, custom-bound for Vita in Niger leather, her initials engraved on the spine. Aww. Interestingly... That's a love letter. Orlando's publication appears to have marked kind of the beginning of the end of their romantic relationship. Oh, no. So Vita... 1928 is a tough year on lesbians. Yeah, yeah. But again, they're technically linked romantically through 35, so, I mean, it was a long... I think I, I think the idea is like between like 26 and 28 was sort of the most intense period of their time together. Okay. But again, Vita was seeing other people too. Like, uh, I don't know. Um, so after Orlando comes out, Vita starts becoming annoyed that Virginia's apparently sort of like sitting at home writing these epic fantasy stories starring her. But in real life, she was not super effusive in her... Um, Love. and her affections yeah huh. and so Vita's like well wait a minute like I'm more than just a character for your writing like I'm I'm a human I have needs <laughs> so you know probably a common hazard for creatives um, so from Virginia's side the fact that Vita was also having affairs with other people in the Bloomsbury group and sure. somebody from the BBC oh. and like a fling with a journalist and the journalist's girlfriend, a female journalist, I shouldn't. Yeah. Um, so uh, the pop of his piece on brainpickings.org includes part of a letter that Vita sent to Harold shortly after he met Virginia. Quote, I simply adore Virginia Woolf and so would you. You would fall quite flat before her charm and personality. Mrs. Wolf is so simple. She does give the impression of something big. She is utterly unaffected. There are no outward adornments. She dresses quite atrociously. At first you think she's plain, then a sort of spiritual beauty imposes itself on you, uh-huh. and you find a fascination in watching her. She was smarter last night. That is to say, the wool and orange stockings were replaced by yellow silk ones. But she still wore the pumps. She is both detached and human, silent till she wants to say something, and then says it supremely well. I've rarely taken such a fancy to anyone, and I think she likes me. At least she asked me to Richmond, where she lives. Darling, 
I have quite lost my heart. Aww. So as the years rolled on, Virginia became increasingly frustrated by Vita's promiscuity, her adherence to the British class structure that privileged her above so many women. And a room of one's own is sort of a direct repudiation of, I don't know, Vita's life. (laughs) And that was in 1930. Like, Hmm. I think Virginia was trying to have a conversation with her about it that Vita wouldn't have, couldn't have. So yeah, later, uh, Virginia Woolf was a lifelong pacifist and she got, she really got upset about Harold's friendship with this guy who forms the the British Union of Fascists. And by the time the the buff, um, by the time the British Union of Fascists had come into being, Harold was no longer associated with the guy, but it was still like, you don't go full Nazi overnight, right? Like there's a gradual buildup. It's a grooming process. Yeah. So by 1935, you know, war was on the horizon and there were just tensions and they just, the romantic part ended. Uh, Virginia would live six more years. She would fall into a deep depression uh, and become obsessed with death Mm. as her, their London home was destroyed in the war. Like, Mm. yeah. So March 28, 1941, she fills her coat pockets with stones and walks into a river. It's the saddest. Yeah. It was like, a month before they found her body, too. <sighs> Rough. Really? Wow. All right. So Vita went on to live until 1962. Really? She died of cancer that June at the age of 70. Wow. At her home, Sissinghurst Castle. Um, she apparently designed amazing gardens there. And then the National Trust took it over after uh, Harold died six years later. Anyway, by the time the 1940s got underway, there was less appetite for that more classical style Sure. Of, of writing, people were very into like, ooh, stream of consciousness. Virginia Woolf is so good. Anyway, have you so, heard about this Faulkner guy? Right. Hey, what about Hemingway? <laughs> the American invasion, as it were. Okay, so um, yeah, she started to just sort of seem like yesterday's news professionally, and it, that did not thrill her, obviously. But she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1947 and a companion of honor, ah. which maybe is the only thing when I, I'm not sure those things were together in the Wikipedia entry. So I'm not sure when women could be full members of the Royal Societies. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Harold outlived her by a few years, dying in May 68 at Sissinghurst as well. He was 81. And their son, Nigel, would go on to publish works by and about his parents, including Vita's, like, 1923, not very fictional portrayal of their marriage, portrait of a marriage, um, in the 70s. Interesting. And it was, like, super queer. Yeah. Just yeah, super queer. queer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the best of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Would have been banned. Anyway, so, yeah, there's... Vita, man. That was a great story. I had no idea. And Harold, too. a story. I really do recommend the, um, I mean, if, if you're into this type of story, the movie uh, Vita and Virginia was a really interesting look at two very interesting marriages. Awesome. Yeah. That was well done. Hey, thanks. Stacy. Thanks. Hell of a story. We'll overlap with what you've been doing. I love it. Cross the channel. I love it. See, this story just gave me another idea about who I'm go- what I'm going to do next. Good. Ha ha. Good. Serving volley back to you, lady. I've got, there's another one I have in mind from like before this period, but fascinating. This if is so if much I can fun. find enough source to actually do a story on it. Y'all, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. You're the very best. Thank you so much for your support. Happy Cinco de Mayo. And happy Cinco de Mayo and trashy love. And I hope everybody. Gets an oatmeal raisin cookie today, Lies. or chocolate chip, whatever oh, you like. Perfect. Your your choice. There's no there's no good. There's no bad. Don't disappoint raisins. My God, I love. Just walk on by, Renee. That leaves me more oatmeal raisin cookies. Thanks everybody for tuning in. You're the very best. Until we talk to you again, keep it trashy. Stay trashy, everybody. Quite trashy. In your English country home. Which, again, there's no amount of cleaning that will get this clean. (laughs) There's not. Cheers, friends. See you next time. Bye. Bye.
Oh, I gotta stop it, don't I? <laughs> Trash Pandas, thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy Store on Instagram. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at trashydivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at trashy divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we split. We, split. <laughs> we also have a trashy divorces discussion group on Facebook. If you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep Keep it it trashy, trashy, y'all.